and welcome to the sick podcast talk about business ai and comedy we're two former googlers uh hit that like and subscribe mostly comedy. button mostly comedy yeah i got my wendy's hat on because we're now you know people say i look like i'm working in the back of a wendy's which is true Nine don't they have to pay days. you a really high wage now uh they do like 20 bucks an hour yeah but, yeah so we'll see how that works out i'm really excited about that but the robots are probably gonna take my jobs um so we're gonna get into a lot of stuff today let's start with open ai of course uh the nav open ai released their new synthetic voice model well, the ai thirst trapped about their synthetic voice model so basically what they're saying is this thing um can if it gets 15 seconds of your voice then basically it can just clone your voice so basically you and me joe are screwed um there's so we're going to eventually get our voices cloned. Um, that's just the way it is. Uh, end goal of this job is like, you know, hopefully get GPT-10 to just take over our, our work and just, you know, present my likeness, my likeness. But to get a GPT-10, though, it has to be able to, like, mispronounce words, which I don't know if it's going to be able to do. So we'll see how that works out. So um, it lists out some use cases for this thing. And it said um, providing reading assistance to non-readers and children through natural sounding emotive voices. Um representing a wider range of speakers than what's possible with the preset voices. Uh, Age of Learning, an educational technology company dedicated to the academic success of children, has been using this to generate prescriptive voices over content. So let's hear it. Force is a push or pull that can make an object move, stop, or change direction. Imagine you're riding a bike down a hill. First, the push you give off the ground. That's an adorable voice. Um, there's one. Some of the most amazing habitats on Earth are found in the rain. God, that sounds like Lamar Burton, but I need to need to confirm the, the mm. old reading, reading rainbow guy. Um, translating content uh, like videos and podcasts, so creators and businesses can reach out, reach more people around the world fluently in their own voices. This is what me and Joe want because I want this thing to be um, translated into all languages. From like, mm -hmm. I want to be in Hindi, I want to be in Chinese, like African yep. cl African click languages, like everything um and so this is like i wish youtube would just like implement something like this like right now um so i mean there's a, there's a go for it Say it, there's Joe. a spectrum of of automatic translation that you want right mm -hmm. like you want to be able to see a youtube video and uh if it's in a, a language you don't speak you'd like to have subtitles and you'd like to have controls that say go ahead and give me the voice in the language that i do speak and then you want to have probably even another setting that says, go ahead and modify the speakers so they look like they're saying the words in my language, Ooh. which is a sort of bridge that we haven't crossed yet. Exactly. And that would be that would be super great. Um, and, you know, there are there in uh, open is kind of slow rolling this right now. They're like not releasing it yet. Well, yeah, they know it's going to be a total disaster when they finally release it. Right. I mean. If you buy the whole responsible release policy thing, then that's what they're doing. And they're giving the government a chance to figure out what it's going to do when this capability is public. And if the government takes too long to figure it out, they'll get preempted because somebody else will release it. Mm -hmm. That's true. And there's already, you know, um, there's already companies doing this that are out there. There's probably doing it not as well as OpenAI would do, but like Descript. If you give them some of your mm -hmm. uh, uh, voice, they can clone it for you. There's a lot of different AI companies, but there's not one that's like 15 seconds of, uh, well, probably there might be 15 seconds of speech that I can clone you. And then mm -hmm. I also wonder what their release strategy is going to be. Like, are they going to say, hey, we're just going to flip this on to anyone? All 7 billion people in the world can just use it. And now everyone can do voice cloning if they want to. So the problem with that, though, is that if you just wait for a year, there's going to be four or five other companies that have this thing working, you know, nearly as well, or maybe even better. And there are going to be open source projects that are released where you can just download it and run it yourself on your desktop. So if you wait long enough, it's just not going to matter. Exactly. And so the question is like, do you want it be, to be done open, by open AI or do you want some random folks to release it too? Mm -hmm. The government might have more influence on a, a centralized open AI than just some random cottage businesses around the world. Right. And the, the, prior art that we have is that the government asks people to put watermarks on things. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine an analog where the government asks everyone who runs such a model to put a audio watermark on something so that if you have the right way of decoding it, you can determine who recorded it and using what service, right? Exactly. And I also like growing up, 
my mother gave me like a code word saying, like, hey, if any strange men try to like pick you up, you got to ask what the code word is. I'm not, not hit on me, but like, hey, kid, I got some candy. Let's go in there because I wasn't a cute kid. Um, and so I think this is just going to bring people back to being like, let's have code words uh, just so I know <laughs> that you're not a scammer on the phone or let's, oh. face, let, let's FaceTime this. But then eventually then they're going to clone faces, too. But still, um, I think we're going to go probably old school. It's going to be a feeding frenzy, though. I know a lot of scammers are going to like they're licking their chops about having this type of technology. Mm-hmm. Um, so yep. I can, I can see both, I can see both arguments, but my selfishly for myself, it's like, God, this is in our hands right now. We could just dub every, change everything. And well, imagine you get a phone call from someone who, who, you know, pretty well, and it's their voice, but something is slightly off. Like you can't really put your finger on it. It just doesn't seem like you're talking to them. Exactly. So that's why Joe, um, we need to create a WhatsApp group where we just say like a super inappropriate stuff to each other <laughs> that could ruin our careers and then so when, when we call each other on the phone I'm like all right joe what was a super inappropriate thing that we said and you'll respond sorry as a language model i can't say it wasn't that. me that's it the shaggy me. defense exactly it wasn't me great song i would play wasn't me. uh we recognize that generating speech that resembles people's voices has serious risks which are especially top of mind in election year we're engaging with u.s and international partners oh across no the not an election year i know oh no i just no matter oh, what no open ai and uh, anthropic should already have their, their press releases and just release sorry your guy didn't win i know it's our fault we apologize because I, I i just know kevin roos already has an article penned in new york times and is just waiting to like press the trigger if the orange man wins and be like ai is the reason why this happened oh that's right blame <laughs> just, it blame the ai yeah just like that's like facebook like uh, everyone loved facebook in 2008 when it helped obama win and whatnot social media was great and then when the orange man wins it's like oh uh, this is just the antichrist you know so this uh this news out of open ai is interesting but i'm surprised we're not talking about um the this reorganization where sam altman's not a uh, general partner of the open ai startup fund Oh, really? I missed that one. Let me go look it up real quick. Sam Altman, reorg- start talking about it when I look for it. So basically, I think what happened, if, I, if I'm reading this article correctly from uh, Reuters, is that Sam was the general partner in charge of the OpenAI Startup Fund, which is a fund that invests in AI companies, uh, I think with, uh, no pun intended, an eye on things that OpenAI might acquire or that further their business interests. Right. And it was Sam and another guy, Ian something, who, Ian Hathaway, who, yeah. were, who were general partners. I don't know if there's any other general partners, but they essentially removed Sam and left Ian in place. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think the idea there is to say, it's, you know, maybe it's a conflict of interest. So this way things are neater. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I, who brought that up? I know the people from All In Podcasts are bringing, the, bringing that thing up or whatnot. And uh, they were they were moaning about it. Um, so OpenAI company behind Jenner. <sighs> Breathe, Jordan. Breathe. It's matter. It's okay. No, no, no. It's just that it's blocking the. <laughs> they are they have all these pop ups and everything. And oh so, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so OpenAI, the company behind Generative AI chatbot ChatGPT, has removed the CEO Sam Altman as the owner and manager of its corporate venture fund. The fund used to invest in startups will now be managed by Ian Hathaway, as Axios reported. Hathaway has been a partner in the fund since it launched in 2021 and has led investments in startups like Harvey. Um, actually, I haven't heard a lot from Harvey. It's been a while. I know I remember the big announcement it made because Harvey's that. Yeah, they made a big splash and then went yeah. quiet. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see because I remember like some consulting firms were saying, yeah, we're using Harvey. So um, Altman is no longer listed as general partner in the fund. As previously communicated, the fund's initial GPT, GP structure was temporarily arrangement and involved no personal investment or financial interest from Sam. This charge provides further clarity. Okay, so that was another thing OpenAI was doing was like, oh, he's leading his own, leading the fund and making money on the side. And the whole and they don't mention is only compensation Sam is getting from OpenAI is healthcare. <laughs> Which just shows that even one of the richest people in the world still needs a company to give them healthcare because our healthcare system is so screwed up. Um, and so, so yes, he's not double dealing on deals. He was just a GP there. Probably made sense because in the pinch when he started this company, they need someone there. And why not get the guy who leads Y Combinator who's already doing deals all the time? Great, whatever. Um, 
The company did not immediately respond to our request for comment from Quartz. The fund is marketed as a corporate venture fund. However, its governing structure is unique. Traditionally, these types of funds invest in the company's money, and startups are managed by a third party. In this case, OpenAI Fund, the money was raised by Altman via OpenAI Partners, such as Microsoft, and was managed by Altman. OpenAI is not an investor, according to the fund's website. The fund is looking to invest $175 million in early-stage startups in the fields of healthcare law, education, energy, infrastructure, the sciences, and more. The fund currently controls a gross of 325 million assets. I, we were trying to get our mutual friend. She had a really, really good idea. She wanted to create like our own like version of like you said an AI dating app, and um, we thought she had the, the best, per, one of the best people to do it because she also is normy and like presentable and super duper smart and is not like a, like a creeper presenting this that VCs don't want to deal with. And we were trying to see if she wanted to apply for this, but she decided to go in a different direction. Um, so thank you for bringing it up. Um, and this whole voice engine thing, uh, I I hope it will be interesting to see when OpenAI decides to release this thing. Um, and they're choosing to preview it, but not widely release this technology at this time. We hope to preview the voice engine both underscores its potential and also motivates the need to bol uh, bolster society's resilience against the challenges brought by uh, ever more convincing generative models. Specifically, we encourage steps like phasing out voice-based authentication as a security measure for accessing <laughs> bank accounts. Yes, 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 yes. They, they, my bank's been trying to get me to do that forever. And I'm like, wait a minute, they can already spoof voices. I don't want to do that. Um, exploring policies to protect the use of individuals' voices in AI, educating the public and understanding capabilities and limitations of AI technologies, including the possibilities of deceptive AI content. Go ahead, Joe. These poor banks, man. Can you imagine how many people are calling their bank every hour saying, I've lost my ability to log in. I don't remember my password or it won't take my password, which is another way of saying I forgot my password. Yeah. I mean, the banks were, are trying to do anything they can so people can get access to their account, even though they're forgetting their passwords constantly. Exactly. They, they, they would kill for probably for, what do you think, biometric identification? So people, it's like, okay, great. Just put your fingerprint and let's look at your eye scan. It's all you have to do. Just don't forget your eyes, your fingerprint, and we never have to have these conversations ever again. Plus, you and I were talking about how, how skewed their revenue is, right? Like mm -hmm. the vast majority of accounts at the bank are money losers. Like the bank doesn't yeah. want to spend more money to support those people. They're already losing money. Exactly. That's why they were and starting char charging for checking accounts. That was really precisely. And then here, you know, they try to do something like voice, uh, you know, login as a way to eliminate or get around this password problem. And now they're just screwed. It's like, nope, turn that off. Yep. There you go again. Back to the drawing board. Balderdash, they say, the Monopoly guy says with <laughs> his top hat. Um, so exploring policies to protect the, uh, the use of individual voices in AI, educating the public and understanding capabilities and limitations of AI technologies, including possibilities of separate AI content, accelerating development and adoption of techniques for tracking the origin of audiovisual content. So it's always clear when they're interacting with a real person or with AI. So Wait, are you going back to the agenda? Uh, what do you mean? Yes, the original one, the vision one. I was yeah. going to throw you off again by pointing Go out that uh, OpenAI is allowing people to use chat gpt without creating an account yes it was really interesting though like this has been a hellish day for me because it's, it's april fool's day so when they were launching it i was trying to read into the story like oh they're not trying to get me are they um and so like, oh, here, here it is like everyone like so let's let's see if i got it right here um what's interesting to me is they're giving people if if this is an april fool's they're giving people access to chat gpt without creating an account i assume mm -hmm. it'll be a less capable model yeah. Uh, and it still doesn't give them the ability to retrieve information broadly. So it's mm -hmm. like a it's like a frozen version of chat GPT, you know, that we started with. Interesting. And do they say like you can do like a few queries before they like log in wall you and say now you need to sign up? Didn't say anything about that. Yeah. It's interesting. It's like a try before you buy. Um also I wonder if they're opening themselves up to issues where now this any random person can like put crap in there and now they don't have a way to track them besides what their IP, I guess. I think um, it's them trying to address their claim that they wanted to bring the technology to a broad audience. Yeah. You know, because you know, Elon was accusing them of not being, not being a true foundation or being pu public minded or whatever the accusation right. was, but I'm totally right. clear. But remember their defense was we meant open AI in the sense of the benefits would be provided to everyone. Not that it would necessarily be open source. Yep. And, he, and yeah, go ahead. So this is sort of a step that, that way. It's like, 
it's almost like a public good. You can just come and use it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's good. I guess there's a population of people who don't, I guess, have login accounts and things like that or just want to kick the tires or also just be more like a Google model. There's your search. Just type in whatever. No login. You're good to go. Um, I want to go over to a story relating uh, Cognition Labs and also the AI market. So Cognition Labs, a startup develop, um, developing artificial intelligence tool for writing code, is in talks with investors to raise funding and evaluation of up to $2 billion. Um, they were originally going to go for $1 billion, but now they're looking at $2 billion. Um, Co Cognition only began working on its product last year and doesn't generate any meaningful revenue. They're the ones who create Devon AI. Uh, it was valued at $350 million earlier this year in a $21 million deal led by Founders Fund, Peter Thiel, the billionaire mm -hmm. investor who started Founders Fund, helped lead its investment in Cognition. The new fundraising deal hasn't been finalized, meaning that the terms could change. The company recently has turned down offers of valuations near $1 billion. Um, Cognition is the latest young startup whose value has soared thanks to a boom in artificial intelligence. In December, the French AI model developer Mistral with Le Chat hit a $2 billion valuation, a roughly seven-fold increase from a funding round the prior summer. Perplexity, a two-year-old AI startup is valued at $1 billion. And it, everyone who's like listening, these valuations are literally just a VC does a line of cocaine and is like, uh, I think this is worth a billion. Everyone shakes hands. So it's all like, it's all, it's all crap. Are um, you saying these valuations are not a science? They're, they're, they're not a science, sir. <laughs> they're actually, no, they are. You learn the science at uh, Juco State of Western Samoa That's right. after you get your AI at the sixth degree. Can't you uh, be brought up on charges if you claim something is more valuable than other people think it is? I'm pretty sure people can. Yes, I'm pretty sure that is, that is a law because it leads to other taxation issues or it could be. Uh, misrepresentation to your investors. Um, so, you know, because hmm. then you can basically like say, like, hey, invest in this deal. We really think it's worth like $10 million. So put a million in and then they're like really getting nothing. Um, Cognition introduced its AI coding tool, Devon, earlier this month and said it's able to autonomously complete complex coding tasks. But then this is a crowded space. Other companies such as like Microsoft's GitHub Copilot is involved in the space and it actually grew its subscriber base by 30% to 1.3 million users. That's a bizarre comparison. Yeah, I think they're because like Devin's like end to end. I'm going to finish your product, and then they bring it. They bring up GitHub Copilot with more of like autocomplete these lines of code right, for me. It's end to end, and it's also tackling the whole code base at once. Mm -hmm. I mean, GitHub Copilot is about the files you have open in the in your IDE. Exactly. It's like yeah, exactly. I think the the GitHub right it makes sense. Um, Magic AI startup competitor Cognition received 170 million from uh, venture capitalists in February. Uh, despite, prom despite promising signs of growth, the ballooning valuations of new AI startups has stoked fears the industry is headed into another bubble. So far, few startups have been able headed to show... Headed into a bubble? Oh, yes. They... <laughs> wow, that's a bold prediction. <laughs> I know. How... I had no idea. I had no <laughs> idea this was going to happen. I mean, you know, it's not like you have one founder getting a check for $110 million and just running around and just creating open source models and then all this other shenanigans. Um they then go into, later on, it says, in a presentation earlier this month, the venture capital firm Sequoia, who invested in SBF, S FCX, estimated that the AI industry spent $50 billion in the NVIDIA chips used to train advanced AI models last year, but brought in only $3 billion in revenue. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's too early to say. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, let me get back. One, it's like a really early, it's a really early market. Two, there's way too much money going into people building foundation models when they don't need to do it. Like everyone and their mother has like a foundation model now, so yes, there there is there is like bloat. But I will say mm -hmm. there's actually value being created here, and I feel the tangible value every day when I'm using various products. Like feel I start, the AGI. I feel the AGI. Do you feel the AGI? Um, and just I guess got access to Opus, uh, Opus dot Pro, and it helps make all of our shorts now. And it was a process that was taking me two hours. Now it's going down to like 15 minutes a day. Just because of that, and that thing's backed by probably GPT nice. or something. So now you have fantastic. more time to research the headlines and make sure you hit them all. I know it caught me slipping. It's just this man. His name. We is, need uh, to talk about his this Microsoft Bo Teams thing. Okay. Yes, actually, that's something I should probably know about. Being that I yeah, was Slack. Like you're the, and, yeah, you're the inside source here. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, teams and so the uh, so basically the news is Microsoft is going to pull Teams out of Office. The way they've already been doing in the inside the EU countries, mm -hmm. based on some I don't know six months ago settlement with the EU. Yeah, uh, I think the theory here is that by by creating Teams, 
which as far as I can tell is a clone of Slack mm-hmm. and then bundling teams into office. Microsoft discouraged other companies from either buying Slack or developing their own version of Slack. I think that's the full reasoning from the EU. And the consequence was that Microsoft was forced to unbundle teams from office in the EU, and now they're going to do it globally. I think that's everything. Did I miss it? Yep. That's, 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 that's basically it. And there's a new pricing structure and, um, Let's see here what the pricing structure is. Um, Okay. Now we're announcing our plan to extend approach worldwide. Global consistent licensing helps ensure clarity for customers. Changes in enterprise suites. So uh, existing suites with Teams, Office 365, Microsoft 365 suites. Um, New suite without Teams after April 1st. Office 365, no Teams pricing $7.75. With Teams, it's $20.75. So they're saying the value of Teams is $13. And then what is Slack cost per seat right now? $7.25 per seat. That's what Slack is being being billed at right now. Um, so if I was uh, David Sachs right now, I would be like, yes, and uh, blue-collar people, they need to compete and for losing the robots. Like, that's just the way it is, it's capitalism. And then when it comes to enterprise software, he's like, no, 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 these big enterprise uh behemoths are destroying my startups and we need the government to come protect them because this is not this is not capitalism this isn't fair this is monopolistic practices it's so Uh, strange that vcs would be talking their own book i would never would have guessed it never would have guessed it all at all capitalism for uh thee but not for me so let's go back to this bubble theme real quick what we're talking about i didn't i i saw I, i need to finish reading this article but it has a nice little chart here and it said dot com versus AI, other similarities and differences. Similarities. Uh, Netscape and OpenAI as a catalyst innovators. Differences. Microsoft killed Netscape. This time they're partnering with OpenAI. Similarities. Web was funded by Telco CapEx as hyperscalers are funding AI CapEx. Differences. But there was no internet and cloud. Similarities. Picks and shovels, highly valued Cisco, Sun, NVIDIA, AWS. Differences. NVIDIA and hyperscalers have more durable business models. Uh, TBD. Um, I, I'm looking at Nvidia though. It's Who writes these things? I don't know, but it's like Nvidia is like it's a commodity product at the end of the day right now. I, I, I mean, it's it's a juggernaut, but it should be a commodity product just like RAM, just like CPUs become. So, um, not going to make any calls. People and people to do their investments. You do you, and timing is always terrible. But like hypothetically, other people should be entering this market in another, another, a couple more years, putting pricing pressure on Nvidia. Yeah, but um, you got to catch up to Jensen. He, that yes. company is still alive, right? Right, exactly. That's the that's the differentiator right there. Um, so I thought it was interesting. And then there's a before we get into um, we're gonna we're gonna talk one more story about just the companies are going are frantic right now trying to figure out data, data, data. Where am I gonna get my data? I'm gonna read some read some what? snippets from this. Um, Fang companies are hungry for uh, getting data to train AI. The internet really? is too small. Firms such as OpenAI and Anthropic are working to find enough information to train next generation artificial intelligence models. But I think, like, what about synthetic data? OpenAI and, and Anthropic are not Fang companies. Mm, it's, I take that back. I saw Uncle Sundar's face here and I said Fang companies. So, uh, uh, so. AI companies are hunting for untapped information sources and rethinking how they train these systems. OpenAI, the maker of ChatGPT, has discussed training its next GPT-5 on transcriptions of public YouTube videos. People familiar with Matter said. Companies are also experimenting with using AI-generated synthetic data as training material and approach an approach many researchers say could actually cause crippling malfunctions. Crippling malfunctions. Crippling. Yes. These I, really like training on synthetic clean data. It's worse than going on Twitter and having some uh, random person who thinks the water is going to turn the gender of the frogs. Like, oh, that's better data than synthetic data? Okay. Um, these efforts are often secret because executives th- uh, think solutions could be a competitive advantage. Uh, the data shortage is a frontier research problem, said Ari Marcos, an AI researcher who worked at Meta Platforms and Google's DeepMind unit before founding Dataology Ada AI last year. His company, whose backers include a number of AI pioneers, build tools to, tools to improve data selection, which would help companies train AI models for cheaper. Uh, there is no established way of doing this. 
Data is among several essential AI resources in short supply. The chips needed to run what are called large language models behind ChatGPT, Google Gemini, and other AI bots are scarce, and industry leaders worry about a dearth of data centers and the electricity oh, no. and the power of them. The, the way people think of data is they're like looking at it as like it's like some like hidden gold or it's like a it's like an oil resource or mm -hmm. something that powers everything. When a lot of data is just completely like freaking junk. Um, so yeah, it's very low quality. Exactly. Um, AI language models are built using uh, tech. Okay, so uh, let's continue going. But Pablo Villalobos, who studies artificial intelligence for research institute Epoch, estimates GPT-4 is trained on as many as 12 trillion tokens based on a uh, computer science principle called the chinchilla scaling laws. An mm -hmm. AI system like GPT-5 would need 60 trillion to 100 trillion tokens of data if researchers continue to follow the current growth trajectory. Mm -hmm. Harnessing all high-quality language and image data available could still leave a shortfall of 10 trillion to 20 trillion tokens or more, Villalobos said, and it isn't clear how to bridge the gap. Um, so I'm thinking, I mean, I heard some researchers are currently working on synthetic and I think synthetic should be more, should be a higher percentage of the data training mix as time goes on. I think. Yeah. So I don't know if this is really like, a, maybe this might be kind of like an overhyped problem. Any, any thoughts on this show? Wasn't it just a few years ago that all the honeybees in, in the United States were supposed to be dying off and it was a huge catastrophe and our food supply would be threatened. It was going to be the end of society. And then our, the time. news today is that the honeybee population is at an all-time high. Exactly. Which is I'm going to put this kind of uh, data scaremongering into the same category with the honeybees. That sounds about right. Um, and I'm also doing my best to bring honeybees back. I have so many lantanas in the front. They're like, it's honeybee. Like, we, what we really need is like a tattoo or a brand or something, kind of like the scarlet letter. If you're a journalist and you publish one of these sky is falling articles... And then within a few years, it turns out to be, t you, you should get the brand. Yeah. Like we no, should true. know from that's then true. on. Yeah. And well, that's why for us, we have the book of grudges. Um, yes. And so and we have also have predictions. So we'll put this guy in there. I know. Should we just say, let's put for predictions right now, like for April 1st, even it's April We Fool's predict Day. that the data is not going to run out. Okay. We predict. This is a non-problem. Gotcha. We predict data. By the way, we also, uh, I'll throw in at least, energy is not going to be the problem either. And energy won't be the problem either. I'll take that one too. I don't think that's a. I think it's a. And we're gonna say by like uh, four one. Yeah, we're not gonna need Sam's fusion reactors either. No, we have enough if we just actually use what we we got properly. We can't even get approval yeah. to build a regular fusion reactor, much less a fission reactor. I, yes. I'm sorry. Just switch get, that. Yeah, switch that around. Yeah, I was like, really? Wow. I know, but yeah, fission reactor. Like, I mean, we have Diablo Canyon. We're trying to shut down, which is the stupidest thing ever. Think how the governor's like, hey, hey whoa, whoa, time out. We can't do that. We need electricity. So I put that down our, on our book of our, our, our bets of predictions. Um, mm -hmm. Also, for all y'all who are watching, um, we just dropped some more premium content. We talked about um, teaching AI to play video games, GPT-4 stroke detection, and Andre Capazzi nice. on Elon's management style. And then also we had Soli Olmar we spoke to. And then we are going to get into some more premium content after we're done here. So uh, go to patreon.com forward slash fic, and for five bucks a month, you can get access to our premium content plus our reading list. Okay, next thing, meet and Empath empathetic voice interface, the first AI with an emotional intelligence launching its API for developers in April 2024. Mm -hmm. um, I was seeing people who were like, oh my God, this is going to be like the end. It's going to manipulate the elections. I'm like, oh, or the elections. Oh, the elections. Good heavens. Or it's going to allow people. <laughs> Good to... heavens, Mrs. Nakamoto. Exactly. What a great you died it up when we can't find anything. Uh, it's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. So I was thinking to myself, like, it or... It blinded me with science. <laughs> or what's going to happen is it's going to allow it to that when people are talking to an AI model for therapy and talking about some really touchy subjects, the model is more empathetic, can help get out of their cocoon so they can actually work on their problems. But uh, but people initially go to, like, uh, election manipulation and all the other uh, mm. scaremongering. And also for customer service. Instead of talking to a lifeless bot, you have a bot that can actually... Hey, what are you? So let's watch this real quick. Hey, what the guy's are you? Gonna... Uh, the million dollar question. I am Evie Hume's empathic voice interface. Curious, are you? Yeah. Well, Could you tell me more about Hume? Hume's doing fascinating work. We're a startup focused on aligning AI with human well-being. Our mission is to build emotional. Can you tell me more about what AI. that means to align AI sure. with human well-being? Well, Hume is pioneering a new... Ah, yes, human well-being. That's at the core of Hume's work. The idea 
is to create AI systems that can actually understand and respond to can human Can you tell me more about needs. the values behind this, though? Sure. You got it. Hume's values are all about putting human well-being first. We believe AI should enhance. Nice, but what products has Hume made so far? Like, what are you built? Great question. Hume has developed several innovative products, including our empathic voice interface. That's me. We also have APIs for expression measurement, custom models, and more. Yeah, Take can a look you show around. me one of your cool models? Sure thing. Ooh, let me take you to our facial expression model. This deep learning model can analyze the nuanced emotional expressions on faces with incredible accuracy. It's a key nice, part of but I actually wanted to see a voice model. Got it, my apologies. Let me show you our <laughs> prosody model instead. This analyzes the rhythm, stress, and intonation of speech, That's understands exactly the emotional meaning behind the words. It's a crucial oh, part wow. of the this is really cool. Um, how can I get in touch with your team? I am so glad you're excited about our work. The best way to get in touch with our team is okay. through the contact. This sounds great. Thank you. Bye, Evie. You're welcome. So what's your take? Uh, I think it's kind of cool. I mean, I, when you're talking to a customer service bot and you're like pissed and it's just like, <laughs> hi, everything's great. Like, this sucks. Get me to an operator. Okay. Like, if it, <laughs> it could be like, just like, it's like, I understand you're upset. I'm really sorry about it. We're going to get you to a human. At too least much, something like too much Johnny cab. Yeah. Too much Johnny cab. Something acknowledges your issue because like a lot of hostage negotiators, what they're taught is when they deal with a tense situation, you're supposed to um, get into the person's mind who's speaking and actually like trying to like, yeah, I recognize you're stressed right now. I probably would be stressed too. Is that a correct reading of that? Or can you tell me more instead of telling them like, stop being emotional, it creates conflict. Cause now you're like judging the person. So <laughs> I think if I can echo back emotion, I think it's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. um, I thought demo was, was decent. I was, didn't think it was the greatest thing ever, but you could tell when he was getting snippy with a model, the model's like, Oh, sorry. And it, you could tell the models inflection of his voice. You could realize like it kind of screwed up. Um, and I think those mm -hmm. as time gets on, they're going to get better and better with it. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, they're supposed to be opening up an API later this month so developers can start using it. Um, but there's like just so many models coming out right now, it's like really hard to keep, keep track of them all. Well, Hume's been working on uh, models related to emotions for quite a while. This is just sort of wrapping up a lot of their work and packaging up as a chatbot. Um, and the demo struck me because they were primarily trying to show you that you could uh, interrupt the model and it would back off and it would restart what it was saying. And that's something that current voice interaction systems have a problem with. Um, it's hard to, I mean, the fundamental problem is someone's speaking and it's hard to know when they've stopped speaking and when they're just pausing. And it helps a lot if you have video, but, but either way, it's still a problem. And then inevitably two people will start speaking at the same time and one of them stops or backs up and the other one keeps going. So, Nobody's really nailed that. There's different approaches to doing it. And he was trying to show in the demo by purposefully interrupting it several times that, that there's is good at that, which I think is interesting. It's got nothing to do with the motion. Um, the other thing that's interesting is what you said about having the, the automated system match your emotional sort of level. That's interesting. Uh, that means they're not only able to generate a certain emotional background, but they're also able to sense it in your voice, which is kind of interesting. I think it's interesting to think about sucking the emotion out of someone's voice in an offline format. Like, for example, I take a political speech and I map out how the speaker's emotions are exposed through what they're saying at different points in the speech, especially like how truthful does the speaker believe they're being while they're talking? Like people are going to have a field day with that. Go into like potential use cases. Would it be just like, person speaking and then you can do polling the audience to see what what aspects of their what they're saying is like rec is they're um resonating with them Begins well they do that already them. right yeah they they have people rating like a speech in real time and sort of voting on it and then the i don't know what they're called but the the political uh managers are watching those ratings and sort of evaluating the candidate's speech and helping them tune it next time but this is a an automated version like you could have someone delivering a speech to you and put something over the speech that's sort of showing you how are they feeling about the thing they're saying. 
Oh, they really believe what they're saying. So that basically means every corporate CEO working for a SaaS company would then be, well, they wouldn't want this because everyone knows they don't believe what they're saying. <laughs> every I'm, every say earnings announcement, which by law has to be recorded and provided to everyone. Oh, so then you could really see, okay, they said this, like they're really excited about something, but the way, based on the intonation of voice, the emotions, they're not really faking it. It's not true. Right. Next quarter is going to be better than this terrible quarter. Mm -hmm. Is that, yeah. do, do they believe that when they're saying it? Right. And you're making me think too, is when I've seen this technology, like they're saying this is great for customer service and you can, we can also read people's faces and emotion. I'm like, bro, no, that's what the market, you know, the market is. Uh, hot, uh, uh, interrogations of murder suspects and things like that. <laughs> like the police, the detectives are all over this stuff because you get a good detective and they basically form their own mo mental model of talking to so many different people they can tell who's being deceptive. They give a and if I was a CEO or a politician, I would ask my team to set this thing up for me mm -hmm. and then try speaking into it and watching how it's rating my, my speech and try to figure out how I attenuate it or game it entirely. That's so. What's so true? Do you mean also like a feedback loop of seeing? Oh, I thought I was coming across if I was going to lift Joe's spirits. What I'm saying, but the model's actually saying I'm coming across something something different. So let me fix it. So basically, Jeb Bush would come talk to the model, and the model will explode and say, "Okay, you just need to just, just don't get into politics, or I need to spend six months <laughs> with you to fix everything, so you can actually, like, I don't know, make people feel alive when you're talking to them." Um, okay, so let's get to the research. We just, it, it's been a while. Uh, we need to give uh, our awesome patreon exclusive folks some quality research and this is our reading list we actually got some really nice uh feedback recently um dave who has a phd he said and to reiterate part of where you guys discuss recent research papers and the google doc you shared with the annotated bibliography is incredibly valuable um and then we have kunal k say as an ai enthusiast i'm bombarded by extreme viewpoints eac or doomers and constant stream of news it helps me make sense of it all with a healthy dose of humor to keep things inter interesting so thank you both for supporting us we appreciate it yeah so for thanks. the first first paper we're going to do we're going to do design design uh to code and i'm going to read from our reading list that's on here the overview um Research focus. The paper studies how advanced AI, which can understand both image and text, can transform website designs into actual code just by looking at a picture of a web page. Problem addressed. Mm -hmm. The challenge tackled in this research is measuring how well these AI models, like GPT-4 Vision, can take a screenshot of a web page and turn it directly into correct web code to make a functional page that looks the same. So, uh, solution results. The team created a new way to test these AI systems with 484 different web pages and paired it with a mix of computer and human evaluations to ensure accuracy. They found that the, the model they tuned, as well as GPT-4, were quite good at this task, often created web pages that look even better than the original uh, to the human eye. Business implications, well, I mean, kind of self-explanatory, but if these AI models continue to improve, they might revolutionize how web development is done, turning visual designs into, into usable websites quickly, and sometimes even enhancing the final product. This could save businesses time and money and possibly change the role of human web developers. Um, any thoughts on this paper, Joe? So many. I mean, this is such a, a, a weird time to be automating these things. So first of all, uh, this goes back to a quick demo that Greg Brockman did when GPT-4 was just being introduced, where he sketched out a simple website on a napkin, took a photo of it on his phone and fed it to GPT-4 for vision, like a, before it was available. Uh, and it, it spewed back at him the code for a basic HTML website with a little bit of JavaScript in it. And he copied and pasted it and made it work, right? And everyone freaked out. Yep. And this kind of uh, design is much more extensive. Like the examples are much more complex than what he demoed, but it's sort of a straight line uh, development. Like you kind of, you kind of should have expected this to happen. Uh, I think what's really fascinating is this is sort of the reverse of the process that we talked about with the guy from Multion and the other person we talked to more recently who's also doing an agent. Sully. Saul. Yep. Sully. Yep. Um, and both of them are trying to take website designs and figure out how to get something done, right? Like what actions to trigger. This is the opposite. You have a, a design brief, a picture of something, you're trying to get generate the code to implement that crazy thing. And I'm kind of wondering, like, even if we pull this off and it's a great achievement, how much longer do we care about this? Right. Just you basically mean is like, we shouldn't even be worrying about the code. That should be the computer's problem. We should just basically be saying... This is what I want. Create it. Right. Right. And, and also, why am I implementing more websites? 
if the future UI is I talk to an agent and it figures out how to get something done for me, then the target is not people. Exactly. It's how do I make these, uh, whatever my data is easily accessible by these crawling AI agents to get stuff done. Um, right. I ha had this problem multi on great service. I'm a true believer I'm paying for it, but there's still <laughs> things that need to improve. But what their issues are dealing with is some websites are designed for um, the you uh the ui designers who love johnny ives and wear boot cup jeans and go to <laughs> burning man and whatever you like they think is terrible what they like is the best thing ever some of the way they design their websites is terrible for these ai agents um so no i, I agree continue what, what you're saying joe i don't want to steal your thunder no that makes sense and i think you got it perfectly i i'm curious like are people starting to test their website or or mobile app designs with these agents that seems like the future direction to go. And then an, another kind of question is, why are we designing, putting, we're putting a lot of work into designing websites and mobile apps. Uh, maybe they're not as important in the future. And at the same time, we're putting a ton of work into building agents that know how to manipulate these websites and mobile apps for us on, on, the, on our behalf. Like, why not just go direct? We specify what we want. And the agent tries to achieve that against some new uh, thing we expose that basically presents our functionality in a way that the agent can use it. Exactly. I, I, I agree with you because when I first got access to ChatGPT, I was so used to using systems that only required structured data to get stuff done. When mm -hmm. I get this machine that's like sitting there like, hi, I can – you can just tell me anything and I'll do it for you. It's like just the, the mental concept you have to change. And I think that's what you got a lot going on here is just the momentum of everyone's so used to the old way of doing things. And it just takes a, the right jackass to be like, you know what? Screw it. Rip the Band-Aid. We're going to change things up. That uh, jackass is us. Exactly. Right? That's true. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, I feel like ripping the Band-Aid off is a good way to describe it. Um, somewhere in between building these super complex agents that need to understand these godforsaken websites and trying to draw pretty pictures and then automatically generate the code that would implement those pictures as websites, I feel like there's a more direct path. Agreed. Agreed. And I'm wondering who has, what Johnny, I have to say, courage to remove the USB, the B ports and screw everyone over. Who has that courage to do that? Is the it courage to remove the USB ports? Yeah, or to remove the audio jacks and piss people off. <laughs> Uh, who such and, courage? Yeah, I wonder if it's gonna if that's gonna come from top down, or that's gonna come organically from the bottom up. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that happens. Um, interesting things also. They say uh, annotators think GPT four generated web pages can replace the original reference pages in forty nine percent of the cases in terms of visual appearance and content, and perhaps surprisingly. In 64% of the cases, GPT-4 vision generated web pages that are considered better than the original reference web pages, uh, which I found interesting. So not only can this handle all the code and everything, but it can also make them prettier and better and improve your sites. So mm -hmm. be interesting. But to remember, see current web pages and mobile UIs are not evaluated by voting, right? There's a group of people, the experts, the usability experts, who who evaluate these designs and make decisions on our behalf. Mm -hmm. Right. And what this paper is trying to do is let people make their own evaluation based on existing designs and then GPT four generated designs. And, and I'm with them and, and that all makes sense. But, but the next step would be quit having people evaluate these website designs and produce functionality that a language model would evaluate uh, in terms of how well the language model can understand and make use of that functionality. Yeah, I'm going to clip this and just send this to um, Omar from Multion and be like, I think it's time for y'all to just do it yourself. Create your own data training set or something, different websites, mm. and then say, here, if you want to see if your agent works on well for Multion, here's our training set, and just create the standard. Because this is really good research because they – also create their own training set here so other researchers can see if they can improve upon this, which is great. And I mm -hmm. agree with what you're saying. Um, so yeah, yeah, I like the, your idea. The yeah. Multion guys could say, put the URL for your website here mm -hmm. uh, and, and maybe give us a list of, of 
uh, English level descriptions of tasks you want to perform on your website. And we'll run our agent and tell you how easy it was for us to figure out your website. Exactly. And your site becomes multi-on ready. And for mm -hmm. the big enterprises, they don't care. But for us small people working in meth labs, like knowing that certain services I'm going to use are multi-on ready, so I don't have to worry if the bots can work or, work or not, that, that's great. Um, so yeah, another thing I wanted to talk about here is they got really, they had some really awesome ideas about how to use the prompts. They said, inspired by recent work on using LLMs to self-improve their own generations, we also developed a self-revision prompt where we provide the following as input. 